Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me welcome to the to this lecture by Artmut Rosa, um, entitled uh, "Acceleration of the World of Work." Uh, before we proceed, I would like to um, uh, to start with some to let you know how the session will be uh, organized, will be structured. So we will start with the greetings from the vice dean. Uh, of the Faculty of Economics, Professor Ernst Costa. Um, I will subsequently present the guest speaker, Professor Armut Rosa, and our commentator, Professor Elisio Stanke. Uh, then Professor Elisio Stanke will start by providing a, a, a general overview of the work of Professor Rosa, and we'll pose a few questions to him. Only then will we have uh, the lecture by Professor Rosa. So um, I will now immediately uh, give the word to the Vice Dean uh, of the Faculty of Economics, uh, Professor Ernst Costa, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you to all. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon to all the participants and especially a special greetings to Professor Hartmut Rosa for attending this seminar. Uh, yes, on behalf of the Dean of the Faculty, and of course, on behalf of myself as a Vice Dean of the Faculty, I would say that's an honor to, to us to receive you here at the, at the Faculty, despite this virtual means. Of course, it was scheduled for a participation physically, but unfortunately, it was not possible. But anyway, I would like to thank you for your kindness to, to keep the, the program and to, to be uh, uh, available to us to discuss and to present uh, the seminar with uh, for us. I would say that there is a double meaning related with this uh, with this uh, conference. On the one hand, it takes place uh, uh, at the moment uh, uh, when the faculty is celebrating the 50th anniversary. Uh, of course, uh, the faculty was founded in 1972, in December 1972. And since the December 1972 until December of this year, we have a lot of initiatives related with this celebration. Uh, of course, this is a this might seems to be might seems to be a, a short thing because we are talking about a, a, a faculty which belongs to a university with more more than seven hundreds of history. But anyway, it's very important to us to celebrate this this uh, uh, symbolic event, this symbolic uh, anniversary. And this is a faculty. Of course, your talk is on the will be from I would say from the side of sociology. But this is a, a plural faculty. We have other, other areas of knowledge like economics, like uh, management, international relations, and sociology. Uh, but of course, the title of the faculty is the Faculty of, of Economics. And we also offer a lot of master programs and PhD programs in different in all these different areas of, of knowledge. So I would say this is the first reason why it's very important to receive you at the faculty. And the second one, it is related with the fact that uh, it will reinforce the cooperation that we have been establishing with your universities, namely with the University of, of Vienna, through previous contacts, especially with our colleague, Professor Elisio Stank. So the challenge we basically set to you was to uh, endorse the team related with the acceleration of the world of work, precisely because in the next two or three days, we're going to celebrate, organize a colloquium uh, at SESH, at Center for Social T Studies uh, as a way of celebrating the University of Faculty, precisely titled Work, Economic, Economy and Society. And that's why we basically thought that could be very useful to uh, basically uh, uh, put you the challenge to, to explore this connection between uh, acceleration and world, uh, and world of work. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much, Professor Hartmut. Uh, we short, we for sure will benefit from your knowledge and we are eager to learn from it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Hermes Costa. Um, I will uh, be very brief because you want to listen to our guest, <laughs> uh, but I would also like on behalf of the Center for Social Studies to rejoice uh, for our participation in the celebration of the fifth university of the Faculty of Economics of the University of Quimbert to the co-organization of this lecture and then as well as at the international conference that uh, uh, will take place on the 3rd and 14th of October. And um, this is so because there is a, 
a long and close relationship between uh, the faculty and the research center throughout the years and decades where we um, jointly conduct research as well as collaborating teaching and training programs under the doctoral offer in which says and folk effectively uh, have been actively cooperated including in the in in the the analysis of labor and work related matters as this conference is a extraordinary example of just that um i will now then st go straight to what brings us uh, together here um it's my pleasure to introduce you uh, our guest professor Artmut rosa um, who is professor of theoretical and general sociology of the Institute of Sociology of the University of Vienna. He is director of the Max Weber Institute in Erfurt, uh, both in Germany, and is also one of the editors of the international journal Time and Society. Professor Ross uh, has also held visiting professorships in various prestigious universities, such as the New School of Social research in New York and the universities of Augsburg, Deutsch Anson and Mannheim, among others. He has a wide list of publications. I will just name a few of them. Um, Social Acceleration, A New Theory of Modernity, published by Columbia University Press in 2013. Uh, uh, the Uncontrollability of the World, uh, published by Polity Press in 2020, and Resonance, a sociology of our relationship uh, to the world, published in 2021 by Polity Press. So uh, as you, you certainly know, he has received uh, numerous awards for, for his, his work, um, most recently from the Gottfried uh, Villa Wine Lineman's Prize uh, uh, this year, and all these prizes he has uh, received them for his groundbreaking work in the field of critical norm based analysis of modern societies and for his contributions to the question of, uh, of which social dy dynamics promote or prevent possibilities for a good life. Um, uh, Professor Lizio Stank will um, will uh, present uh, with more in depth uh, some of these contributions. Uh, as you also know, Professor Lizio Stank uh, um, is professor of uh, the Faculty of Economics as well, researcher from the Center for Social Studies, and he has also worked on on closely related topics within the sociology of work, the sociology of organizations, social movements, and unionism, among others. And he has also published widely on these topics. As, as Professor Costa has mentioned, uh, there is a, a long collaboration between uh, Professor Rosa and Professor Stank throughout the years, uh, uh, institutional and uh, also personal personally and through um, the various professorships uh, that both have had in uh, in uh, in various universities such as uh, in Germany and most recently in Brazil at the University of São Paulo and um, and this is also one of the reasons why we have this conf conference here today so um without any further ado i invite professor stank to to provide us a, a more in-depth presentation of uh, professor Rosa's work thank you thank you anna uh good afternoon everyone I hope the, the sound is okay for everybody. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to, to be here. It's an honor to me to take the responsibility of uh, dialoguing with Hartmut Rosen and his theory. And besides, I regret uh, that you couldn't come physically to us and wish you a very fast recovery from, uh, from the COVID disease. I obviously uh, do not intend to present here a detailed uh, critical analysis 
given the, the vast dimension and complexity of his work, of course. Therefore, what I propose is just a brief set of notes and questions that uh, have arose, especially around the concepts of uh, acceleration and uh, resonance. So uh, the first note uh, refers to his uh, systemic vision of modernity. According to Hartmut Ross, the Western modernity promoted on the one hand, a process of autonomy of the subject, and on the other, a dynamic of change and acceleration that led societies away from this initial promise. With modernity, a kind of hedonistic promise emerged in society, uh, fulfilling or replacing the old religious promise of the medieval era. However, the, the dialectic uh, between this ethical political project and the sense of transformation has led to a breakdown in the initial promise, which has been felt particularly strong with the triumph of neoliberal globalization. In the line with the well-known Weberian sociologists, such, such as, for example, Ralph Darendorf, modern society is characterized by dynamic stability. But throughout, throughout its transformation, the dynamism of modernity has been confronted with different rates of acceleration or deceleration also, causing various forms of what Hartmut Rosa um, refers as desynchronization. First, the synchronization between modernity and nature, which generates ecological crisis. Second, the synchronization between democracy and the market, which generates, generates crisis and erosion of democracy. Third, the synchronization between the speed of the financial markets and the real economy, which generates financial and economic crisis. At the same time, on a subjective level, there is also a desynchronization between the human psyche and the acceleration. It seems to be a key element here because in this case, the author takes us to another level of abstraction over the structures or structuring processes in society. So here, the, my question for, for Hartmut is, how do these modes of the synchronization affect social segments, groups, and social classes that are so diverse and opposed to each other? In your work, it seems to be a great deal of emphasis on the abstract subject, but some underestimation, it seems to me, of the role of structures of domination. So, as a sociologist, what do you see as the main connections between phenomenological dynamics and socioeconomic structures, such as social classes in the 21st century global capitalism? Now, second note refers to the arrhythmics generated by the tension and disconnection of the space to time variables. Hartmut Rosa sees the project of modernity essentially from the space-time approach, wanting to show that the increase in complexity and the centrality of movement, together with the demands of timing of the most diverse activities. As a result, time-space structures are transformed by the pressure exerted by the dynamics of modernity based on, on a dimension such as individualization, rationalization, and differentiation, which the author mobilizes on the basis of a tension between the volume of action of actions available to individuals and institutions and the time units available to carry out them uh, those goals. So the rate of acceleration is measured by the imba imbalance between speed and time available. That is, modernity is characterized by the relationship between the quantitative movement of fields of action and the time available to carry out these demands. The axis of acceleration 
technical acceleration, social acceleration, and acceleration of the rhythm of life are conceived as an intertwined cycle of interconnections. Although, can we imagine the primacy of each of these axes must vary, must vary according to different historical conjunctures or contexts, such as pandemics, wars, financial crisis, etc. The author quotes uh, Karl Marx to point out that in capitalism, the labor capital, the capital labor relation is not really about buying labor power, but about buying working time. In other words, the capitalist system as an economic system based on the ownership, production and distribution of goods and services is above all fueled by the exploitation of individual and family time resources, exercising control over the time taken away from workers and their families. And here my question is um, about the structural role of productive activity as taken on, particularly in the appropriation of technical equipments with a view to unlimited economic growth. Hartmut Rosa rejects economic determinism as the primacy force behind acceleration, and he avoids taking individuals or the sociocultural context of the world of life, using here a reference to uh, Jürgen Habermas, as opponents of spheres colonized by the system. He highlights the force of subjectivities that in a secular society no longer believes in a life beyond death, which drives us to maximize the use of time, doing more in less time, in a drive that aims to double the experiences of life possible in a lifetime. I would invite the author to comment on, on the place of economic structures and so social classes also in this process. The third note on the loosening and detachment, the disintegration of society. I'd like to start by asking if there is a moment of a period in which uh, we can situate the transition from the classical modernity to the area, to the era of uh, uh, so-called late modernity. We know that the pace of acceleration is increasing spontaneously. In his positive vision, for example, Emil Durkheim and various other Viberian authors raised the issue of complexity and the disclosing of individuals from their communities of origin as part of a process of identity fragmentation that could induce enemy and conflict in the 19th century society, as we all know. But, for example, Durkheim also foresaw the so-called organic solidarity as a possible solution with the help of corpora professional corporations as a possible way of rebalancing society. Uh, I, I'd like to make a short quotation of the Hartmut Rosa when he says that uh, it is clear how much the acceleration of transportation, communication and production has influenced subjects in their self relations and in their relations with the world. And with this, the socially relevant models of identity, identification with spaces, which fixed communication partners with reference groups and with things uh, taken on a temporarily limited and contingent character, the subject is now forced to distance or emancipate themselves from the so-called, uh, the, from the, the, from so that they can withstand a change voluntary or not without losing their self. In short, transition, dislocation, disconnection, Fluidity, detach, detachment seems to be trends that inject the subject with this feeling of living on a, or, or on a slippery slope. 
creating the sensation of a permanent changing social landscape that inhibits the individual from making choices and planning lives, planning the future uh, of the constant uh, with the constant obsession with reducing time and reacting to obsolescence. So here the question is, if the speed of acceleration is unavoidable as a trend to totalitarian uh, nature, if it seems to, to lead to a one-dimensional individual as uh, Herbert Marcuse, how can this process be reversed is my maybe naive question. <laughs> what is the role of the public sociologist in the stopping acceleration as alienation? In addition, what might also ask uh, under that conditions, could a possible return to dynamic stability take place? And whether this hypothetical return to a buen vivid society requires a central role of institutions or whether it will have to be stimulated by counter movements in rupture with the market. So this is the my questions. And finally, uh, one uh, fourth note refers to the notion of resonance developed upon the concept of recognition by Axel Honneth. It seeks to it seeks to reach another trait of human nature in which the potential of empathy is reflected in the field of social relationships structured in a dimension where power is absent. It seems that power relations are secondary. The concept of resonance refers to, I would say, transformative non-instrumental encounters that last over time between two or more subjects or between subjects of na nature or between subjects and a specific context, like, uh, for example, a piece of art, music, or a given, so a given social cultural context. In uh, this is, this is an inner process of self-transformation, which results in a bound of uh, touches each other, each other of the parties in an empathic, empathetic relationship of a profound and transformational way, a resonant encounter or the vibrational encounter. It is a dynamic processual happening with its own force and premeditated and uncontrollable, which, uh, by, but which induces a profound change in the relationship between the subject and the world. And here, my final question uh, is, if resonance occurs, so to speak, in a spontaneous way, there is no search, re search for resonance or there is no struggle for resonance, what is the political potential of, of, of this concept? If a resonance-oriented social critic is to guide every everyday practices, but also institutions, more in line with resonance, how and who are the protagonists of a possible activism guided by dispositions open to the spirit of resonance? And this is my my last uh, question to Hartmut Rosen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Stank. Um, we have already some, some background and context for the talk that you are about to hear and some, some questions already posed. So I now give the floor to Professor Hartmut Rosen to, to make his presentation and to respond to the, the four questions already posed as he please while presenting or at the end of the presentation. So please welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ana Santos, for this uh, for, for moderating us and for the introduction. And uh, thanks to the uh, Vice Dean uh, Hermes Costa and uh, also, of course, to Elisa Estank for the for Elisio for the interesting questions and for the invitation to your 
uh, to, to Coimbra. I really would have loved to go there because, uh, as you said, there's a long standing relationship also between the universities of Jena and, and, and the University of Coimbra, even with our former uh, di um, director, um, uh, Klaus Dicke. And uh, Eligio has been uh, in, uh, in Jena and we met in Salvador and I really wanted to go there. But last week, COVID struck again and it gave me really a high fever. So we decided uh, to better not take the risk again and, and do it this way. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity for this. I'm not sure whether I will be able to answer all the questions because it's very tricky ones, right? right with, we have just heard by Elisio. Uh, I will try to refer to them uh, during my presentation, and then, uh, but then we can also uh, enter into a discussion and, uh, and see how far we get collectively. Um, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm always a bit torn. I think if one gives a presentation digitally, uh, I, I normally rather prefer to not use PowerPoint slides because if you use PowerPoint slides, then most of the screen is just the slides, right? And the speaker is just a, a narrow uh, a window up there. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, since I, I, I assume that you are not a native English speaker as I am, it's for me, it's always much easier if I see it on a slide, right? So I, uh, I decided, okay, I'll do a PowerPoint slides, which I'm very happy to share with you. And I will try to get that started. Okay, acceleration and the world of work. So I'm um, I'm not really an expert, of course. I mean, I'm not focusing, at least not exclusively, on labor and work. But I think as a sociologist, you realize how important this is, right? And uh, Elijo has already kind of hinted at it. It's not just um, because of the structural, the economic underpinning of uh, and the importance of of labor and work, but also for the phenomenological side, which I'm interested in, right? I, what I'm developing is a sociology of our relationship to the world, you could say. Um, for me, the basic question of all human and social sciences, right, is how do we how do we relate to the world we find ourselves in, right? Human beings, this is my claim, right? That's the phenomenological claim. We always find ourselves situated in a world. We are all, always already kind of oriented towards a world. And working on this world, right? Work is absolutely essential for the process of interacting with this world. And I really think Marx had a very good point, the early Marx in particular, but, but the later Marx uh, took that up too, that uh, it's through work that we shape ourselves, we reshape the world and we reshape our relationship with the world, right? And with society, right? So, uh, so of course I'm very much interested in work. And as you have already heard, and my analysis for a number of years has been these processes of speeding up interaction with the world, right? So the, the idea really is that we are dynamizing our relationship with the world, right? The world does not stay the same as Marx and Engels have it in the Communist Manifesto, right? Where they, uh, you know, they have the famous quote, all that is solid melts into air. Yeah. It was taken up by Marshall Berman as a, as a title of a book, even as defining modernity. And, and Marx and Engels clearly write that the, the specificity of a capitalist modern society is that we permanently have to revolutionize the way we work, the way we produce, the products we produce and we consume, right? Distribution, consumption, uh, production, of course, are in a permanent process of speeding up. And that's the locomotive you see on the left hand of the, of the image here. It's a, actually a heavy metal cover. I've just written a small book on heavy metal too, a sociology of heavy metal. Uh, it was from the Waterhead album, Orgasmatron. And I like that image because it, 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 it connects the speed of modern life. It's like a locomotive running on the tracks of, you could say, capital accumulation, if you so like. Um, uh, but uh, it, but it's also connected to the inside of subjects, to the cultural side, right? It's, it's speeding up life, dynamizing the world. It's connected to our conception of freedom and of uh, to a hedonistic uh, outlook, if you so like, but also to our conception of happiness. So it's the orgasmatron, right? It's the connection of, of a structural track and the cultural perception of the world. And this, it's what I, the, the formation of modernity, in my understanding, is the combination of these two sides, right? A, a structure which is, which is based on dynamic stabilization. I will come to this in a minute. 
uh, but also cultural outlook, which which seeks the good life when we veer, if you so like through a permanent increase of the horizon of what we can make available, attainable or accessible. I call it the triple A horizon of the good life, right? So acceleration connects a structural and, a, and um, a cultural feature. So what I want to tell you is uh, coming in five steps, if you so like. At first, I will give you a short definition of modern society, which goes together with my conception of social acceleration, right? Um, his biographically, it has been the other way around, so to speak. I was interested in this logic of acceleration because I thought we misunderstand mo modernity and modern life if you think of it only in terms of rationalization or individualization or differentiation or the domestication, the instrumental control of nature. Because uh, what, it, what it also is, is a changing in our way of relating to the world through time. The temporal structures are changing modernity, right? So that's the first part. But then I really want to focus a bit more on, on our, I will uh, come back to your question, um, Elisio, what distinguishes late modernity from classical modernity, right? Um, but uh, our contemporary time, late modernity is driven, the speed process in this time is driven by the logic of digitalization on the one hand as a technological revolution and by the economic logic of parametric optimization. It's not just an economic logic. I will, I will uh, define this in the second step, right? I really believe our way of working in particular, but actually our whole way of living is geared towards this logic of defining parameters, which we make visible, then comparable, and then we try to optimize them. That's the way we live a modern society and particularly a modern workplace looks like in our age. Then I will briefly come back uh, to this, uh, what uh, Elijah also pointed at to my, uh, um, actually my diagnosis, if you so like, I claim that this leads to a double pathology or a twofold pathology. On the one hand, um, there is structural desynchronization. You mentioned it. It leads to ecological disaster, to political problems, uh, and it, on the psychological side, to, to burnout uh, uh, levels, which are really frightening right now. And they are not just on the work-related. Mainly they are work-related, but we see burnout with uh, young students all over the world, really. It's a global phenomenon. And this is why I went to um, Brazil recently, right, invited by a Brazilian association of psychiatrists, who had the who the, the topic of their conf, of their whole conference was um, um, mental health in an age of acceleration and and it's the same in Korea in Japan in everywhere I'm sure in Portugal too that the youngsters the young students high school students in particular and young people they are really suffering mentally and uh, that leads to the inside of the pathology which I claim to be um, alienation and then I will briefly come. Uh, to this, uh, to the concept of resonance and to Elijah's question, actually, how could resonance solve the problem? That's really, I mean, a lot of people ask this quite rightly, right? They say if resonance is a different mode of experience, right? And by the way, it's an uncontrollable mode of experience, right? So how could this be the political and the economic remedy to the problem? So I will come back to this in the last step. So let's move swiftly. Step one. And um, we know that there's a lot of discussion about what modernity is about, but I really have this definition and I think it's important for economists too, because I think, I mean, this is what in my view defines a modern society. It has nothing to do with, the, we know that, for example, in Brazil, a lot of people really hate the concept of modernity. They think it's a Western colonizing, uh, colonizational, imperialistic, value-laden conception. But I, I think it depends on how you define it. So here's my definition. A society can be called modern, but its mode of stabilization is dynamic. This means that it systematically requires material growth, technological acceleration, and cultural innovation in order to reproduce its structure and to maintain the institutional status quo, right? <clears throat> so I'm not claiming that modernity is defined by speed. I'm not claiming that it's defined by growth. And I'm not claiming that only modern societies spe speed up and grow. My claim is that a modern society is a society which, which can only maintain itself it, if it permanently speeds up and grows. And this is dynamic stabilization. And I think this is really a very peculiar feature of modern society. And you only find it here. Right? In Portugal, as in actually all over the world, from China over India, Russia, 
uh, the European Union to the United States or Latin America, all national economies seek growth. They want to get the engines going. And by the way, we have a, an interesting research consortium in Jena and Erfurt uh, looking in, it, into property structures. And um, and it's very interesting that when the, uh, when the Eastern, the communist states broke down, they were looking for capitalism. And they weren't actually, they were not interested really in, they weren't concerned about property structures, right? They didn't ask who will own what, let's privatize the means of production. What they wanted is to get this dynamic system going, dynamic stabilization, the, the, the power of the markets, right? Dynamizing uh, the economic structure, so to speak. That was for them the core of capitalism, which fits very well with my definition, right? The core of capitalism is the fact you could say it's capital accumulation, obviously, with Marx, the formula money, um, uh, commodity money prime is the, is an indicator that economic activity is only done if there is some prospect of a rent or a profit uh, of some sort, right? But the main, what capital, the strength of capitalism, you could say, of a capitalist economy is that it can only maintain its institutional structure through incessant movement and it's not just movement it's movement with increase being faster than your competitors means being cheaper right and uh, it, you have to be the first who introduces a novelty in order to uh, to 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 make uh, the marginal profits necessary there's a number of reasons why speed is of prior importance in capitalism right and why you could say that time is money so this leads um, and but but as Eligio rightly says, I believe that this logic of dynamic stabilization is not just an economic logic. We find it, uh, for example, in science, right? Where I, I I have this formula which I like. It's not money, commodity, money prime. It's knowledge, research, knowledge prime. My claim is that even a university like yours or ours, right, it is are not about maintaining stabilizing a body of knowledge and handing it down we don't treat knowledge as ancient knowledge sacred knowledge which has to be preserved but we treat it as a kind of treasure if you so like which now it's not actually a treasure handed down it's like, like like it's a capital that needs to be reinvested in order to expand the horizon of what is known right we treat knowledge like capital invest knowledge in order to enlarge the horizon of what is known right that's what a university does or an academia right it's not schole handing down knowledge it's investing research in order to extend the 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 power of knowledge and this is not only because of economic pressures and it's the same even in politics it's dynamic stabilization every four or five years you have to be re-elected on the promise of on the basis of a promise for some sort of increase by the way so it's dynamic stabilization in politics and in the arts and everywhere. Right? So in some, this leads to this, what I call the actually the forms of acceleration, as you might know. I don't want to go in depth into depth here because I don't have so much time. But for me, when we speak of acceleration, it's very important to see that there are three different spheres. It's three logics which are interlocked, but they are logically, analytically independent. One is the technological acceleration, speeding up transport, communication, production in particular. Right? But the second is an acceleration of social change. The world does not stay the same. Right? Uh, we, I, I've also defined it as a contraction of the present. Right? The present is uh, everything that is stable right now. Right? So the present, for example, is something that remains as it is, for example, the positions or let's say the the the, the, um, uh, the 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 order of a university, right? The rules of a university or the syllabus of economics or sociology at Coimbra. There is a certain presence. In the past, you had a different uh, set of rules. In the future, you will have another set of rules. But there is a certain presence for it right now, and there is a, a overwhelming tendency for presence of this sort to shrink. Right? Things are the kind of changing. Uh, all the time and the, what is changing its patterns of association its forms of knowledge and forms of practice how things are done really that's the acceleration of social change but there's also an acceleration of the speed of life it's driven by the feeling that we are short on time and this is a feeling individuals have but it's also a feeling organizations have right and organizational agents have right time is always scarce of course that has to do with the fact that time is money 
So modernity is about setting the world in motion, speeding it up literally. I mean, if I had time, I would like to give you the, my, my short uh, story of the aliens. When the aliens are watching, let's assume the aliens are watching the, the, the Earth for centuries, maybe for millennia, they would really see that since the 18th century, we're literally speeding up the world. Right? We started with steamboats or steamships and then railways and then cars and then trams and then subways and now scooters and then cars and trucks and now even airplanes, right? But in addition, also the this, this permanent stream of images and information and capital, we literally set the world in motion and that's what modernity is about. Now, I don't want to, to, to focus too much on this uh, either, but when you think of the world of work and how it's changing, then of course, there, I, I would really say there are two processes. One is what I call digitalization. That's obvious. A lot of people talk about it. And the other is what I call parametric optimi or, uh, optimization, right? It leads to what I call a mode of aggression towards the world. I would really claim that workers, basically we all, right, but also in particular workers, Actually, when they get up in the morning, when we get up in the morning, we are already in a mode of aggression. It's the alarm clock that awakes you, right? It's not the sun coming up or when you slept enough that you get up. Normally, it's the alarm clock. It's alarming you. Work needs to start or the bus is coming or the daughter needs to be brought to the kindergarten or whatever it is, right? And, and, and then basically, we are in a mode of aggression. The main focus of this is the to-do list. You have to do this, you have to do that. And workers, all I know from my studies of work and labor, right, is that they permanently feel that there is too much work to be done within the given period of time you have. And it's obvious in my view that digitalization processes are really driving all three arenas of acceleration nowadays, right? It's digitalization, which is speeding up production, communication, and even transport to a, a significant extent. But it's also digitalization which makes our world change, which is responsible for social change. We change the forms we um, work, but we also change the forms we educate. We change the forms we play. We change the forms we communicate. Basically, everything we do, playing, relaxing, even loving, right? Looking for partners in love or looking for sexual adventures, it's influenced heavily by digitalization. So digitalization is speeding up, process, technical acceleration. It's also driving social change and it's giving people the sense of time being scarce. This is mainly due to the fact that um, and, and now the problem with digitalization, as, as we know, right, is the 24 seven logic, right? You can always work when you have a smartphone or a laptop or an iPad or whatever it might be. You can always play, you can always care for your families. You can always uh, invest in the stock markets if you have something to invest or so. So everything can be done at all times, which means basically the, uh, you cannot put parts of the to-do list on hold, right? So in, in the past, right, when you were at the workplace, you couldn't care for your sick parents or for your child because you had to, you were at the workplace, right? But on the other hand, when you were at home, you couldn't care for the work stuff because the work stuff was in the factory or, or in the office or wherever it was, right? Now you can kind of do everything at the same time. So it's the permanent pressure of the digital logic. So what I want to say is, that digitalization, the logic of digital, digitalization uh, is, is the driving force, the main driving force of technological acceleration, the acceleration of social change and the acceleration of the pace of life. Okay. And uh, as I already said, it's, it leads to an explosion, to a felt explosion of the to-do list. I mean, this is it's very interesting to think about this. Why is the to-do list exploding? We, maybe we can discuss this a bit later. I think the to-do to -do list is mainly it's fed by expectations of which you think that they are somehow legitimate, right? So wherever you go, someone will raise an expectation or will, will make maybe make a blame on you and you feel it's actually true, right? So you get to the workplace and your colleague asks you, oh, did you write the report? And you feel, oh, actually, yeah, I know I should have done. I just didn't have the time, right? And maybe then you go to class and teach, right? And you feel, oh, it's true. I should have prepared the lesson a bit better, right? And after class, a student might approach you, did you grade or mark my paper? 
and you feel, oh yeah, it's true, I should have done that, <laughs> right? And and it goes on and on, right? The colleagues will ask you whether you've written the application for the grant, and you say, oh, I know, I wanted to do this last week, <laughs> right? And 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 then there is a meeting in for a selection committee, and people say, did you read all the applications? And you see, oh no, I didn't read the seven hundred papers. But then it goes on in your family, right? Your partner will say, oh, did you think of the birthday of our son, or so, or the graduation of our daughter, your daughter? And you think. I should have done right and the neighbor will ask you did you mow lo your lawn and you think yes I should have and the doctor will ask you did you relax enough and you think yes I should have <laughs> right so uh, uh so th there is a really an explosion of the to-do list and it's fed by e expectations which we feel are somehow at least legitimate all right now um no, no, I, in the end, right, as I already said, it leads to a mode of aggression towards the world. We, we try, we desperately try to expand the horizon of control in the work life as in the private life, right? And we are not very successful in this. Uh, in uh, I've written this small book on the um, uncontrollability of the world and disponibility. <laughs> And the claim there was that this attempt to control the world leads to monsters of uncontrollability, one of which is the financial market, another one is the atomic bomb or the climate disaster. And by the way, sometimes the smartphone or the iPad, if technology is not working. So it creates subject as a subject of guilt. And the downward escalators, uh, um, Elisio mentioned it, I, I call it uh, once, I call it the slippery slope phenomenon, right? It's like we are standing on downward escalators or, or slipping slopes where we permanently have to run upwards just in order to keep our place. So you could say that in the workplaces elsewhere, agents or organizations are driven on the one hand by the fear of losing out. On the other hand, I mentioned this briefly, by the desire to expand the horizon of what we can make available, attainable, and accessible. This is the promise of the good life, right? Modernity is driven by a certain conception of the good life. You can actually find out about yourselves, among yourselves, when you ask yourself, when do I call something good? Normally, we call something good if it increases the horizon of what we what we can make available, attainable, or accessible, right? So if someone says, I earn more, you earn more money, or I earn more money, you would say, oh, that's good, because <coughs> money, the money you have on your bank account defines the horizon of what is available, attainable, or accessible for you, right? Or if someone says, I have a faster internet, then you would say, oh, that's good for you because the faster internet gives you easier access and, and, and a vaster access to the horizon of everything that has ever been digitalized, right? And uh, it goes on and on in this logic. We call things good if it increases the horizon of what we can make available, attainable, and accessible. Now, let me turn to this second aspect, what I call parametric optimization. I think we haven't, I think probably we haven't thought enough about it. So what I mean is this, with the help of digitalization and mainly on the basis of it, what the, our late modern culture is really defined, it's defined by the attempt to, to um, parametrize, parametricize, so to speak, all aspects of our lives we make parameters of our lives visible, right? You can start with your body, for example, right? Of course, people have measured the pulse or the uh, the blood pressure or their weight on the scales for a long time. But it's a quite recent phenomenon that people have started, you know, normally the doctor would measure your blood pressure when you're sick. But now a lot of people measure their blood, watch their blood pressure every day. So that's one parameter which you make visible. What's my blood pressure? And then uh, you compare it to how it was yesterday and how it should be, what the expectation is. And then you work on it with pills or with a walk or with whatever, how you do, how you do it. It's parametric optimization. Let's optimize your blood pressure. It's the same with the body, with your weight or the body mass index. Right. A lot of people measure it every day. You make it visible. You make it comparable. How did I do last year? How does my neighbor do? What does the doctor say I should do? And then you work on it. Right. It's always this logic of make a parameter visible, comparable, optimizable, so to speak, or manipulable. 
Now people also watch their, the number of steps they take per day, for example. The smartphone that measures it uh, by itself, right? So you make it visible. No one ever cared about the number of steps. Now we have the parameter. Make it visible, comparable, work on it, right? And um, and there are many other body masses in, in, in the body, but also in the internal workings, right? Even in the psyche. How was the quality of your sleep? If you have a smart watch, you can <laughs> measure it. You don't turn inward. You look to the parameter and it says, oh, you could work a bit on your sleep. And then, of course, it's it's the same with the looks and so on. But it's the same logic in the social media. How many followers do you have? How many friends? How many dates? How many likes? How many shares? And so on. And of course, because we want to talk about work, work life is now completely dominated by the logic of the parameter. Right? Think of us as academics, but it's true for all workplaces. But for us as academics, it's very clear, right? Um, um, what's your um, number of publications? What's the number of peer-reviewed applications, publications? What's the international publications? What's your impact factor? What's your rate on the third-party funding um, uh, scale and so on? Or think of the university, right? Uh, how many students do you have? How many doctoral students? How many MA students? What's your ratio of those students who complete their degree to the others? How do they fare with respect to, uh, to um, um, absolvents to, um, um, uh, I forgot the English word. Those who come from other universities, how what's the ranking of Coimbra, right, or of your faculty compared to other uh, universities and so on? So everywhere, and, and, and you know this is br quite brutal. This logic. I mean, in our universities now, they they rank not just in Jena and Erfurt, all over Germany, and I think all over the world, right? They rank students from number one to number five hundred, or how many students you might have, and then students can or or. Or, um, or organizations can ask, what's the rank of this student compared to the others? So that's the logic of parametric optimization, right? And we even think that this is the good life. Define the parameters of, you know, we do it even half consciously, consciously and sometimes without being completely aware of it, right? We, we, but in work life as in private life, we have this awareness of the parameters of the standings of our lives. Of course, that's neoliberal logic. And then we think that working on them, improving a bit my health, improving a bit my earnings, improving a bit, improving a bit my impact factor, improving a bit my like likeability or so, would make my life better, right? So this is a kind of, uh, it, it leads to a responsibility also in organizations and at the workplace. People are responsible for benchmarks, targets, and numbers, right? They are accountable for this, right? And uh, I, I already put it on this slide here. I, I think the good organization, what I aim for, right, would, you know, I, I really think it's very important to focus on this. I think a good organization and a good worker and a good life consists of something like a wide angle attentiveness. This is a word I recently come, I haven't written on it, but I think I'd like to do it, right? Having a, a wide angle, you could also say kind of holistic attentiveness. I, I don't mean mindfulness. I mean kind of being aware of everything that's between the parameters. That's very different from a concentration on the parameters which you can individually uh, optimize or um, improve. All right, uh, so let's move to the next slide, right? Or to the next uh, to the next step. Where does this go wrong? You already heard uh, from Elisio that my claim really is that it leads on the, uh, on the so to speak, on the on the surface of it, on, on the one hand, from the outside, it leads in the structural side, it leads to desynchronization. This logic of dynamizing the world clearly has its limits. There are, and this this addresses a bit the class question, um, Elisio, right? I mean, I, I find it quite interesting to think about class differences and social social structures in terms of speedability. And I do think we know that, the, I mean, there's a, this contested claim uh, between somewheres and anywheres, but I, but I do think that the class conflict is and this on the structural and the cultural side is a bit is a bit between those who kind of are between those who are not indefinitely speedable in the way they live, in the way they work, in the way they interact, right? Um, as compared to those who, who whose lives can be dynamized because they kind of are are the anywheres in, in the world, right? But um, the definition goes like this: <laughs> not all spheres of 
organizational or individual life can be accelerated at the same pace and the faster system or the faster social, social groups systematically put pressure on the slower ones and the risk and some and very often cause desynchronization. So I think that we can really show that the ecological crisis is a crisis of desynchronization. Nature is too slow for a high pace of cutting down trees or fishing the oceans. And uh, it's too slow for the pollution we create <laughs> for doing away with it. And actually, the climate crisis is a speeding up of the atmosphere as a consequence of the speed of economic transaction and, 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 and energy consumption um, on Earth. I even believe the democratic crisis we see all over the world right now is, a, is, a desync, is the result of a desynchronization between democratic politics, which is time consuming. In, in the acceleration book, I tried to prove that the, by the proper logic of the democratic process, actually democ democratic decision making, will formation and decision making uh, are about to slow down because society becomes more complex and less conventional and more dynamic. And the more dynamic, the less conventional and the more diverse a society is, the longer it takes to reach something like a rational consensus on questions. So the proper temporal logic of democracy is slowing down. While, of course, the economy, the economy and the logic of the media system and the, of cultural change is kind of increasing. So you get a bad desynchronization between the speed of democracy on the one hand and the speed of the economic um, the systems on the other hand and the markets on the other hand. We know if something happens like right now in uh, between Israel and Palestine, markets ask for immediate reactions, right? And politicians actually would, uh, would need some time, obviously, right? For will formation and decision making in, in, in complex situations, which they don't have. I even think looking at the temporal disparity between the speed of financial markets, where you can have financial transactions within fractions of seconds, and the speed of the so-called real economy, right, of the metabolism, uh, there you find very bad uh, desynchronizations too. But as I've already said, um, I think the, um, the, maybe the most one of the most dramatic forms right now is desynchronization between the human psyche, the soul, right. And, um, and 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 the pace of of the work and labor world, if you so like, or the economy, because you can really see all over the world burnout rates, stress related diseases, actually even suicide numbers are going up, and it's it's really frightening when you look to the mental health data from the U.S. and Korea are the last ones, but also Brazil, but also Denmark and Holland. Wherever I go, there is a real real concern. I mean, there is a tendency of sociologists to downplay this and say, well, it's a burnout is a discourse phenomenon, right? It's now diagnosed more often, but real hard psychological diseases don't increase. But if you talk to psychiatrists, they tell you a very different story. They do tell you that they find quite frightening new symptoms, new and, and a high density and a new, new form of symptoms. People are kind of getting desperate, particularly young ones. And I, I want, let me make this point right now because it's very important. You asked, what's the difference between modernity and late modernity? Well, I mean, I have a kind of hard case definition, Elisio, which says when that it, it, it depends on the speed of social change, right? On the, what I call the contraction of the present. I believe that modernity was defined by a kind of generational pace of change. Every generation lived on the promise and the idea and the claim to create their own world. But now late modernity is when the speed of change is so high that it's no longer generational, it's intragenerational, right? Nowadays, the young generation doesn't want to create their own world, but they would say, well, for the next four or five years, the world will look like this and no one knows what AI and war and disease and plague and climate disaster will bring after this. But there's an easier definition of late modernity. And I think this is really crucial. In my understanding, um, this, this um, dynamic stabilization, which I define as an, a, the need to increase growth, acceleration and innovation was tied to a cultural perception of progress. I'm not talking about philosophy here. I'm talking about the kind of everyday entrenched sense that people, that we as a society in the workplace, by the way, and through the workplace are moving forward somehow towards a better world. I, I mean, I know this is a, we might discuss this claim 
but you can you can see it in empirical data by the fact that kind of all over the world people particularly of course the middle classes but i think it went very very far, far down the ladder to the uh, to the working classes and at least to the working classes right there was the hope that we are going through hardships that we work very hard but our parents will have a better life I mean, there is uh, interesting research even about Pinochet's Chile, right? Pinochet's Chile, I mean, it's the paradigm case of neoliberalism. But even there, people like, like Mauro Basauri, Basauri claim that it was not so much individual kind of hedonism that was driving the project, but kind of familial outlook. The idea that parents create, uh, create richness, wealth, which they can hand down to the future, right? Give a house, give some uh, earnings, right? Give a flat, an apartment to the next generation. I, I just was in uh, Medellin, in uh, in um, uh, in Colombia, which is a very, which is still a very poor city, right? And in, in and even there, in the poor neighborhoods, in the favelas, right? It's very interesting that people build their very modest housing, right? always in the idea that the next generation will build the next story on top of it and the next generation on top of it, right? It, I really believe this project of modernity, classical modernity is driven by the idea that we connect our lives to the future generation, to a pacified existence, even as uh, Marcuse, uh, uh, Marcuse would say, right? But at least that the future generations would have it easier, that, that they wouldn't have to fight and fear for their lives every day. And late modernity is characterized by the fact that we are no longer moving towards that better future. Nowadays, generations, actually parents all over the world from Silicon Valley to Korea and through Portugal and Germany and Russia and, and China, very clearly China, no one believes that the next generation will have a better life. Parents everywhere say we have to do everything we can in order for our kids to not go down the drain completely. Right. And, but nowadays, the future is no longer the better world we're moving towards. It's the it's, you know, it's a bleak, dark horizon in which the climate crisis might kill us or a new nuclear war might kill us or new plagues and COVID crisis might kill us. But, uh, but whatever will kill us, the idea is the future is blocked and the past seems to be blocked, too, because people no longer believe that the past was this bright march towards enlightenment. It's the history of colonization and slavery and um, imperialism and other things, right, unfortunately, right? So I really think that's the dark side, right, of this logic of um, acceleration, right? So, so, and this creates a feeling of alienation. That's the flip side of aggression, right? In the workplace, as beyond the workplace, uh, our experience of the world is we are in a mode of aggression and we don't really appropriate the world, but we feel it's kind of going away, right? Alienation, for me, the paradigm case of alienation, I have to stop soon, I know. The paradigm case of alienation is burnout, right? Where the world is silent and hostile or indifferent. Everything seems gray and distant. It's very interesting to realize that burnout or depression can be clearly be identified as um, as um, chronopathologies. They are temporal diseases, right? When you are in a depression, time seems to stand still. There is no connection to the future, no no thread, no resonance line that connects the past to the future, right? So so this logic of dynamic stabilization of uh, uh, leads to a very bad um, uh, situation. So how could it be different? Obviously we need, an, I, I really think we might need some, we might still need some forms of markets and competition, but this logic of financially driven, but uh, driven uh, uh, capitalism driven by the financial markets is a problem, right? So we need to overcome dynamic stabilization and replace it by something what I call adaptive stabilization. I don't quite know how to do it, but normally here, particularly when you discuss it with economists, they always ask, well, do you want to go back to Stalinist communism, right? Of course not. So I only give you a very minimal definition of what I have in mind. I, I think of a, a society, the mode of stabilization is adaptive, and that means it needs to be capable of growing, accelerating and innovating whenever there is a wish or a need uh, or at least a good sense of why we should change, accelerate, grow, innovate. Right? But right now, right, we need to change, grow, and innovate just to maintain what we have. And I think that's a pathological 
of a state of um, uh, of um, of affairs. So, but now, um, as as you have heard and as Elisha said, I do have a kind of counter idea, right? Where should we go? What actually? What could a non alienated form of work look like? Because I said at the beginning, the world relationship is defined not only by work, but work is very important, right? So, as I said, right now we are in a mode of kind of aggression towards the world control this, get this done, make this faster, make it easier, and so on. What is a different form of interacting with the mode? It's what I call resonance, right? It's a different form. It's it's a, at the bottom of our existence, a different way of relating to the world. And I, I claim that it's not something I have thought, <laughs> I have thought out, so to speak, on my desk, or something uh, that is the result of long philosophy. I believe it's a basic human form of being in the world. Think of small children. Right. They're actually small children. They are not language animals, not reasonable animals, not possessive animals. They don't want to have things. They want to get in resonance with things. Right? Really watch. I mean, there's very good psych, uh, child um, uh, development, child uh, development uh, psychology, right? which has made this point again and again. What they need and what they ask for and what they wish from day one is getting in resonance with the world, right? realizing that there are eyes out there the eyes of the mother or the father or some significant other who really address me as the subject, right? Who interact with me. So my eyes and their eyes, that's the interplay of resonance, right? And then the baby is getting, it's really getting excited, right? Because, oh, they mean me, they address me and I'm connected with them, right? So it's really this dual movement between being touched by something or someone by a voice by eyes or by something out there calling me and this can be a piece of music an image or actually some work i need to do because the second element is self-efficacy i realize that i can reach out and connect with this other side right in work this is this is how people uh, full uh, experience work as fulfilling right and then it's not just a pain right when they feel oh this is really interesting something is calling me maybe a piece of wood i want to work at richard sennett's work of course is great here when he talk, uh, talks about the crafts right but as i always said my father was a baker and when i saw him interact with the dough right and creating bread I really think this was resonance in its purest forms, right? He loved to do it, right? He felt really called by the by the bread, you could call, right? You could say, and then he felt self-efficacy, right? He could work on the on the on the on the dough, but he would describe it in the sense of you de need to develop a feeling for it. You need to listen to feel it, right? To give it time. So in short, what is resonance? A mode of interacting with the world, which has four elements. Number one, something is really important to me. It speaks to me, it calls me, it touches me. Number two, I feel self-efficacy when I'm working on it, right? And it's even a physical embodied sense of self-efficacy. And quite in the sense of Marx or Hannah Arendt, as we work on the world in this way, right? We are transforming ourselves and the world. This is a prime process of, interaction with the world, right? Working on yourself, working on the world, being transformed in this process and transforming the world. But resonance always has a moment of uncontrollability. It's not parametric optimization. And now, now this is really important because for example, let's go back to my father as a baker. He would really say, every time the bread I get out, out of the oven when it's finished, it's a bit different. It has some uncontrollable element in it. And it's the same when you write a text I really claim work always have good work, always has this, this form. If you write a text, you see immediately what the uncontrollable element is. When we start writing an essay, right, or an article, we never quite know whether we will manage to do it. This is what's so painful about it, right? It what creates procrastination. I don't know whether I'm in the right mood. I'm not sure whether this sentence is right or whether it leads me in the wrong direction. It has this element of uncontrollability. Resonance is this open-ended process, which you cannot say, I will be in resonance tonight. I'll write the text and the best text I've ever written. This is why sometimes we think, oh, maybe I only start tomorrow, right? So resonance is an interaction with the world, transformative, dynamic, effective, and self-efficacy, but open-ended in a certain way. And that's why it's always at odds with parametric optimization. And as we know from Richard Sennett and others, employers always try to kind of to, to shift the logic of work towards the process of parametric optimization. Right? The bread has to be 
optimized parametrically as cheap as possible, as tasty as possible, as fast as possible, as sustainable as possible, and so on. So now, of course, you can produce bread with a computer, right? You just push the buttons and then you produce bread and it's optimized, right? That's no longer uncontrollable, but it's no longer resonant either. So I'm out of time. Let's move to the last slide, if I can, something's wrong. Yes, let's go here. It's the uh, almost the yeah, I, yeah. I just have two slides, but I will I will go over this very quickly. Namely, claiming that work as an axis of resonance, like other forms of resonance, have a number of conditions. Right? We Elisio has already said we cannot bring about resonance. Is it still politically valuable and useful? I would say yes, because we can identify conditions which prevent resonance, which make it impossible. For example, let's just I mean competition and the scarcity of time are the two resonance killers number one, right? If I compete with someone, I cannot resonate with them, right? right. Uh, that, that, but also if I'm short on time, I cannot get in resonance because resonance has this open-endedness, right? So if I have to catch the plane at the airport, I cannot get in resonance with anyone who approaches me, not with a student, not with a colleague, not with a cat or the music I hear from the next building. I have to make myself deaf and dumb and blind in order to catch the plane. And in a neoliberal economy, we are always catching our planes. We are always behind our to-do lists, right? So for example, scarcity of time, social competition and fear are those things which kind of prevent resonance in workplace and in society. Right? So for example, I would really say, an, I, I, I'm dreaming of an organization which is resonance, which means open enough to, to have this wide angle attentiveness to the environment, right? But closed enough to develop an answer from the inside, right? Like, like a guitar model of the self. Now, last slide. Uh, how can we turn this political? As I said, we cannot bring about I mean, you know, you cannot bring about a resonant experience. Of course, when you when you listen to a talk or when you give a talk, you hope that there will be resonance. But I cannot bring it about. Yeah, I can speak hard and then make a lot of gestures, but maybe you it it it, it puts you off even more, right? Yeah. And so we don't know whether there will be resonance or not. Sometimes there is, sometimes there is none. But when there is resonance, you don't know what the result will be, right? So the experience of resonance cannot be fabricated, but we can fabricate we can create two things. One is the conditions of resonance, right? You have to have enough time. You have to have the right group. You have to have the right set. Like, like a conference is supposed to provide such a frame that resonance in scientific work becomes possible. And we can look at the parameters which make it more or less likely. But number two, um, uh, there is something I call dispositional resonance, right? S the subjectivities have to be, uh, so to speak, resonant, which means uh, it, you have to be touchable. That means you make yourself vulnerable, right? And now it's the institutions which allow for resonance or which prevent resonance, right? It depends in a supermarket normally, everything is not geared towards social resonance. The whole logic of the supermarket is such that buying and selling there, right? Kind of, um, and it is, 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 is rather disturbed, right? It's hindered, it's, uh, it's blocked when you enter into resonance. So I think the resonance idea can be used and should be used as, as a yardstick when we devise educational institutions, institutions of care, but also when we create workplaces, think of the institutional conditions. What creates institutional workplace along those four axes? Resonance between employees, for example, or employees and customers. Resonance towards the tools we work with and the objects we work on. A sense of being re in resonant connection with the nature we use, but also with history, what I meant earlier, connecting through the past with the future and allowing people to develop something like a self axis of resonance, being in resonance with themselves, right, with their own uh, memory, their body, their psyche and so on. So there are, if you like to read on this, there are two of the books um, uh, I've written now all uh, available in uh, in Portuguese. There is another one, a small one uh, in Brazil. They just did it on, uh, on uh, democracy and religion, uh, but that's just a kind of a sideline. So thank you very much for listening. And I hope I kind of I'm still in time and I now stop the the slides thanks a lot